Good evening. I hope everybody is healthy and safe and following protocols during this difficult and unprecedented time. I know that everybody has children at home and it's frustrating and it's difficult, but I think we're doing a good job of managing, managing the situation. And if we continue to work together, then Be'ezat Hashem, we will get through it. Everybody will be safe and healthy. Every Tuesday morning at 11.30, I host a women's class on the Parashah Magna David High School. For this week, and perhaps for the going weeks, it's going to be recorded. So this is going to be our first recorded session. Parashat by Akel Pikudeh. And I wanted to pull up our source sheets that we usually use so we can do our class together. Parashat by Akel Pikudeh, of course, discuss the building of the Mishkan. It seems to be a continuation of parashiot terumat tzaveh, almost a mirror image, in fact, of those parashiot, as we continue to discuss the building, the details, the clothing of the kohanim, and all of the vessels of the mishkan. Interestingly enough, a new concept is introduced in parashat vayakil that is introduced immediately as the parasha begins. If we read source number one, the opening pasuk of the parasha. It says, Moshe Rabbeinu gathers together the Jewish people, and he says to them, these are the things that Borei Olam commanded. And the assumption is that the conversation that Moshe is going to begin is going to be about the Mishkan. Interestingly enough, Moshe interrupts himself, and he talks about a different topic. Six days you should do work, and on the seventh day, that is a holy day, it is Shabbat, and anybody that works on that day will be put to death. You're not allowed to light a fire on Shabbat. Moshe interrupts himself. What was otherwise supposed to be, or at least as far as the reader is concerned, a parasha about the Mishkan, becomes a, an imperative about Shabbat. Seems to be, and this is not the only place, as we'll see in a moment, that Shabbat and the Mishkan are intrinsically intertwined. In fact, we learn from this juxtaposition of the two topics, very important halachic principles. All of the 39 melachot that we have, all of the 39 prohibitions of work that we have on Shabbat are drawn from the things that were done in the Mishkan, and that comes from here. For example, you're not allowed to write on Shabbat. Why not? Because in the Mishkan, they wrote on the poles, so they knew where they went, right? The Mishkan was a portable structure. They put it up, they took it down. How did they know how to put it back together after they took it apart? Every pole was marked, 1B, 1C, 1D. They wrote on the poles. Since they wrote, that was a melacha that was done in the building of or the maintaining of the Mishkan, we learn that you're not allowed to do it on Shabbat. What's the connection? The connection, as you can see, is that they are juxtaposed in the Pesukim by Moshe Rabbeinu. Not only that, but we also learn that the concept of milacha on Shabbat, of work on Shabbat, is something that is creative and intentional. All of the work that they did in the Mishkan was creative. They're writing, they're creating words or code. They are lighting a fire. They are sewing. All of thing, these things are creative acts. This is not the only time where we find the Mishkan and Shabbat connected. I take you back to last week's parasha in source number two. Hashem tells Moshe, tell the Jewish people, you should keep my Shabbat because it is a, an ot, a sign between me and them, a intergenerational perpetual sign, and I am God who has made them holy. They have to keep Shabbat, and anybody that does not is put to death. And this comes, again, in the center of the discussion about the Mishkan. In last week's parasha, we started off talking about the Mishkan, the Kiyor, the Mahazita Shekel, other issues dealing with the Mishkan, and in the middle of it, Shabbat. A third time where they are connected, Pashat Kiddoshim, in source number three, 
et shabbatotai tishmoru umikdashi tirao ani adonai. You should keep my Shabbat and you should fear my, sanct- my sanctuary, my Mishkan. Ani Hashem, I am God. So again, it is clear that the Torah is juxtaposing, is connecting the Mishkan and Shabbat. Besides for the halachic connections, which we already mentioned, that we learn the 39 Melachot and the laws of work regarding Shabbat from the Mishkan, there's a philosophical aspect as well that comes out of the fact that they are continuously connected. And for that part of the conversation, we look at source number four. Source number four, Rashi, in this week's parasha, Sheshet Yamim, says Rashi, Hikdim lahem azharat Shabbat v'tzivui melechet ha-mishkan. Hashem gave to the Jewish people the warning about Shabbat before the commandment for the Mishkan, Lomar, to tell you, She'eno dochet ha-Shabbat, to tell you that the building of the Mishkan does not trump Shabbat. Shabbat is actually more important, more significant than the building of the Mishkan. Here is the holiest structure which will one day become the Bet HaMikdash, the structure where Borei Olam is going to be contained, so to speak, the structure where the Ramban writes, we are trying to recreate and encapsulate Matan Torah, where we're going to bring Korbanot, we're going to meet Borei Olam, we're going to make amends in our relationship should we have to. It does not trump the building of that, of that structure, does not trump Shabbat. Shabbat takes precedence, which means the building of the Mishkan shuts down on Shabbat, because that is the most important thing. And that's the philosophical point. Shabbat and the Mishkan symbolize two different aspects, and they are space and time. Mishkan is a symbol of space. It's a holy structure, it's a holy spot. And Judaism believes in the concept that you can sanctify a certain area. Eretz Yisrael is a holy country, a holy state, a holy place. The Bet HaMikdash is a holy spot. The Bet Knesset is a holy spot. The Yeshiva is a holy spot. We believe that you can sanctify a certain area. Space can be made holy, and that is symbolized by the Mishkan. Judaism also believes, perhaps more importantly, that time can also be sanctified. And that is Shabbat, the sanctification of time. Holidays are set aside as a holy time. Everything shuts down and we invest in the people and the things and the moments that are most important to us. Shabbat is a sanctification of time. Everything shuts down. The first mitzvah that the Jewish people got as a nation is Rosh Chodesh. But coming off of decades of slavery in Mitzrayim, we didn't own our own time. It was owned by our masters. Your master pulled you out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, go mow the lawn. You went and you mowed the lawn because time wasn't yours. We are becoming free people. We're standing on the threshold of freedom. We're leaving Egypt. The first thing that God tells us is you will now be in control of your own time. And that is a commodity. It doesn't last forever. Time is precious. It's very significant. It's a gift. And you need to sanctify it. And hence we had the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh as the first mitzvah that was given to us as a nation. The Mishkan is the sanctification of space. Shabbat is the sanctification of time. The message that Ashi highlights in the Pasuk through the connection of these two things, Shabbat and the Mishkan, which happens consistently throughout the Torah, and the fact that Shabbat takes precedence over the Mishkan, is named before the Mishkan, is more significant than the building of the Mishkan, the holiest place that we had, is to say that the sanctification of time must trump, must precede the sanctification of space. And that is to say as follows. Space is the physical aspect of our lives. Time 
is the spiritual aspect of our lives. It's the intangibles. I can't touch time. I can't hold time in my hand. It represents the spirituality that is in my life. The Mishkan space represents the physical part of my life. I can see it. I can touch it. I can hold it. That's physicality. Often, we spend our lives trying to conquer space. We want to accumulate wealth. We want to accumulate things. We want to accumulate real estate. We want to make a mark and conquer our spot, our limelight, our space in this world. That often it comes at the expense of spirituality. The message here of the Mishkan, of the connection between the Mishkan and Shabbat and the fact that Shabbat trumps the Mishkan is to say, we need to be very conscious of that because that's a misgiving of man. That often we allow our pursuit of the physicality to trump our pursuit of the spirituality. Bore Olam is saying here, stop, stop. Spirituality and the conquering of spirituality has to be a primary thing in your life, more so than your conquering of space. And hence Shabbat comes first. And it's highlighted in a midrash, in source number five, the Gemara Berachot, Amar Rabbi Shemuel Bar Nachmani, Amar Rabbi Yohanan, said Rabbi Shemuel, the son of Nachmani, in the name of Rabbi Yonatan, B'Tzalel al Shem Chochmato, Nikra. B'Tzalel was called that name because he was a very wise man. B'Sha'a Sh'Amar Lo Kadosh Baruch Hu LeMoshe Lech Emor Lo LeB'Tzalel Aseli Mishkan Aron BeKelim. Halach Moshe ve'hafach. Right? Hashem told Moshe, go and build for me, tell B'Tzalel to build for me a Mishkan and Aaron and the other vessels that will go in the Mishkan. Halach Moshe ve'hafach. Moshe went and he reorganized the order of commandments and the way things should be built. And he said to B'Tzalel, Ase Aaron ve'kelim u'mishkan. Build an Aaron and the other vessels and the Mishkan. Amar lo Moshe Rabenu, min Amar lo. B'Tzalel said to Moshe, Moshe Rabenu, min Hagoshel Olam, Adam bone bayit ve'achar kach machnis letocho kelim, kelim ve'ata omer aseli Aron ve'kelim u'mishkan, kelim shani osel lehecha nachnis. Shemekach Amar lecha Kadosh Baruch Hu, ase Mishkan Aron ve'kelim. Amar lo Sheme B'Tzalel, ha'ita v'yadata. B'Tzalel says to Moshe, Moshe, you got it wrong. You told me build an Aron and Kelim and then the Mishkan. But I'm going to build these Kelim and I'm not going to have a place to put them. When a person builds a house and then once he builds a house, he fills it with furnishings. He puts a couch and he puts a refrigerator and he puts beds. You don't do the, you don't buy the refrigerator and the couch and then build the house around it. Why would you tell me that first you should build the utensils and then you should build the Mishkan? First you build the Mishkan and then you build the utensils. Moshe Rabbeinu's comment to B'Tzalel, his message to B'Tzalel was first time and then space. The Mishkan is space. The Kelim on the inside represented the time, the spiritual aspect. The Aron was the Torah. Menorah was the mitzvot. All of those things that we would use in the worship of Borei Olam that symbolized time, that symbolized spirituality, those come first. So yes, my commandment, my mandate to you is first build the Kelim and then build the Mishkan around it as a message to the people that first they should conquer space. Oh, sorry. First they should conquer time. First they should conquer spirituality and then they should conquer space. And I think it's a very important message given everything that's going on right now. There's no space to conquer. Everything has been shut down. Can't go out for dinner, can't go to the movies, can't really go shopping. There's, there's nothing else to do, but there's a lot of time. Our children are home and it's difficult and it's frustrating, but it's also an opportunity to spend time with them. How often do we get as invested as we can be in our children's education than right now? Sit with them while they're learning with their teacher, not in video, and hear the discussion and then talk to them about it. It's an opportunity to invest in those things that are representative of time, of spiritual, or intangible. These are intangible moments. 
we can turn a difficult, unprecedented, very disconcerting and uncertain time into an opportunity by investing in the things that are represented by time. And those are the things that are spiritual. Our children, our families, our religion, our spirituality. There's more Torah happening now, at least online, than I've seen before. There are classes every second on, on Zoom and other venues to keep us engaged. It is an opportunity and it's an important message. We spend so much time trying to conquer space, but you can't take it with you. And so little time trying to conquer time, the spirituality, the intangible things. And those are the things at the end of the day that are going to matter. Ch your children won't take your dining room table with them, but they will take the messages and the values and the ideals and the traditions that you give over to them as you sit on that dining room table on the holidays and on Shabbat and on those sanctified times. And it is probably best noted by a Gemara Masechet Shabbat in the last source on the page. It says the Gemara, and I struggled with it for years until I finally understood it, it says, Says the Gemara, a person who takes large steps, it detracts from his eyesight. It takes away one five hundredth of his eyesight. It makes him not see as well. And how does he fix it? How does he get that eyesight back? He looks at the wine of Kiddush on Shabbat when he makes Kiddush. Very strange Gemara. But I think the message is very clear if we can peel away the layers. Somebody who takes large steps. The Gemara is saying somebody who's running through life. Somebody who's constantly on the go. He's running through life to get to the next physical pursuit, to get to the next deal, to get to the next party, to get to the next... The person who's running through life and doesn't take a moment to gain perspective, doesn't take a moment to stop and appreciate the moment and the things that are going on around him, he loses perspective. He doesn't lose his eyesight. He loses perspective. You lost perspective on life. You're moving so quickly to go to the next thing. You didn't even stop to appreciate the one that just passed. What is the antidote? How do I fix that? Shabbat. Everything stops. And you get an opportunity to get some perspective. Your family is at the table. The business is closed. Everything has shut down. And you have an opportunity to stop and appreciate the things that you have that are intangible, that are not part of your physical pursuit. And this is a forced time of stopping. Everything is shut down. And again, it is an opportunity to invest in the things that more often than not, more often than we like to admit, we neglect those things which are time that always get pushed aside in our pursuit of space. As we read Parashiot Vayakel Pikudeh and conclude the book in which we were slaves, the message is very clear. Upon leaving slavery, we were given a gift and that was the gift of time. Don't get, let it get lost in the pursuit of space. And for those who read the parashiot of the Mishkan as tedious parashiot about a building that no longer exists, you're not giving enough credence to the life messages that are embedded in, that, in these parashiot. Read between the lines. A powerful message, certainly one that we can take to heart at this point in time. I want to wish everybody that they should be safe, they should be healthy, they should take the time to enjoy their families, to enjoy their children, and Be'ezat Hashem, this time will end quickly, and we'll be able to go back to normal soon. Amen.